I know it's probably pretty self-explanatory, but it's nice to step back from these services during Holy Week and take a look because they're, they're different than the rest of the year. They're, there's some extraordinary um, part to all of them, and they're all very dramatic. So we come in here, and I, I uh, retrieved an old, old practice. I remember as a kid growing up, we used to go into the sanctuary, and I got to read the Passion or, and, and participate in it, and uh, the priests and all of our servers, we took off our shoes. That was how you began the service. And then we went over and lay down prostrate. And um, I'm not sure exactly why the taking off shoes, but I'll tell you the experience. And I, I don't know about our proclaimers of the word today, but to take off your shoes and walk down the aisle of church, uh, is, it, it just it does something to you. It strips you in a way. And of course, this whole liturgy, this whole week is about stripping us stripping away the stuff that we so easily place all over ourselves. We live with all this stuff. We live through all this stuff, express ourselves, and it's so sometimes yucky and sinful and dead and, and not life-giving. So the liturgy asks us, take off your shoes, lie down flat. Now, lying down flat, prostrate, is also what happens to a deacon and a priest on, at their ordination day. And I've always loved it, especially when it actually came to that point in my life as a priest and, and a deacon before that, to lie down prostrate because that posture is itself a rather unique one. If you were in a situation where somebody was going to attack you and you had fallen, you wouldn't want to lie flat on your face. You'd want to flip over on your back so you could at least kick and scratch and do everything you could to protect yourself. But on your face, you could do nothing. You can't even see what's coming to attack you. And so the posture is to lie down before God, before ordination, and on this day, the day of the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, to lie on our faces just completely naked and, and open to whatever God is going to do or say to us. So that this celebration is supposed to be transformative. After the proclaiming of the passion, which itself is is a difficult thing to do to, to face that awful moment in history. Then after the homily, we have these 10 intercessions that every church in the world says the exact same ones. This is the only day that we all unite around the same intercessions. They're built into the liturgy. So that over, I'm going to say, a billion people, and I assume in the Lutheran and Anglican churches, they probably have I wouldn't be surprised if it's just the same. But we pray these intentions, these intercessions, that unite the whole Catholic Christian world in prayer for these specific, specific things. So they, they're, they're, it's important to hear them today, to pay attention. And then we, we, after that, we have a collection for the Holy Land. And it's, again, it's the only time in the whole year that we do this, on Good Friday, because on Good Friday, and how many pilgrims are there this week and on Good Friday to, to do the Via Crucis there on those streets where Jesus walked? And that's pretty extraordinary to say he walked down these streets, they're stone. And, and, and to have the feeling that this is where the Lord walked before he was murdered. And then after venerating that cross, we share our communion. We don't have Mass, the only day of the year that we don't but we share our communion with the Lord and with one another. Very dramatic. But this year, I don't know why, um, over the last year and a half, I get up every morning and read real early, and, uh, and I've read a bunch of mystics over the last year and a half. And the mystics, they're very intuitive people. The mystics don't just think literally. They, they, ha they have this inner sense that they can connect with God in mysterious ways, the mysteries of God, the mysteries of Christ. And I believe that like a poet or a musician or a dancer, they connect at a deeper level where words aren't sufficient. A definition doesn't do it. You know, so like any one of us, somebody could get up at our funeral, perhaps. People will have the nerve to get up and think that they can sum up your life in a, in a 10 or 15 minute explanation. Well, she loved this, he loved that. This is what they did. They grew in these many ways. They were very special, blah, 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 blah. 
But how do you take 50 or 60 or 70 years of life and think that in a, in a half hour even that you could sum it up? But the real people at those funerals are people who intuitively, they knew this person. And they knew a smile. You can't get up and explain a smile, but you know when you know a smile. You know that when you can describe how someone talks, how they let air out of their lungs, and, and whenever there was something frustrating, they went, ah. And, and that was a favorite part of one of the things that you connected with. This is intuitively, you just know them. Well, I want to come at this today, and I've never done this before, but it's just grabbed me over the last few days, and I realized I had to say it. You see, our definitions in the church about Jesus, that he's truly God and truly man, I have no problem with it, but it doesn't say a whole bunch to me. I, I believe he truly was man. In fact, I believe Jesus was truly man, and he knew that more than he knew what it was to be truly God because the truly God part is where the mystery comes. And this is what the mystics would call the cosmic Christ or the eternal God. Because this is what we basically say. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is how John describes it. He's talking about the eternal God, the eternal Christ, or the cosmic Christ. The Christ of all time. The limitless Christ. The God who always was and always will be. And that God, the Christ, entered into human history in a human person. So, this Christ, the eternal God, came into being birthed in a human life who was Jesus, the Nazarene. And the eternal God, the eternal Christ, entered into his life, and as he lived this life, he didn't live it just as Jesus, the human being, who he was, but as the Christ who lived in him. But the thing about Jesus Christ apparently is that he had this intuitive sense of who he was and what he was and what he had to do. So that what he did and said had this, this bigness to it that attracted people and confused people. And somehow in this human person, Jesus, who was just here for 33 years, this Christ, the eternal God, came into the world in a human form so that we could relate somehow to this Christ, the eternal God, but we really can only do it in human terms. So we connect to Jesus, the man who walked the earth for 33 years and, and, and only three of those years did this incredible ministry and then was rejected and put on the cross to die, but died in such an extraordinary way that when most people would be rejecting, condemning, and hating, and wishing everyone who had a part in their death that they would be put in the deepest part of hell. He said, Father, forgive them all. They don't know what they do. And he showed this extraordinary Christ, the cosmic, eternal one, in his human form with words of love and forgiveness as he's dying. So that we get through the person of this human Jesus Somehow God comes through in such a remarkable way that we say they're one, that he's perfectly human, perfectly divine. And when I say perfectly, I don't mean it with perfection like there's not a single mistake, although some might say that. I mean it there's a perfection to the human spirit of Jesus who walked on this earth, who's infused and suffused with the very living, eternal God. And so... And I know we say this all the time, that he saved us from our sins. I think it's bigger than that. The mystery is that he restored us to our true humanity. The goodness that we talk about in Genesis, that we were made in God's image, like we got a chance to get it back in Jesus Christ. Because who would say to the people that rejected and killed and crucified you, Father, forgive them all, they know not what they do, except God himself. And in this human Jesus, the eternal God so filled him that he could find that in his spirit and authentically say that what he preached about forgiving always, he could do it when all the chips were down. For me, that's Good Friday. We get a chance to touch the eternal God, the cosmic Christ, 
in this human person of Jesus the Christ. But it gets better. Because if that's all we were saying, it would be a mouthful, it would be plenty. We could just be silent for the rest of the year. That's enough. Wow. Except that we are told that Christ is born in us. And like some people like to say about Mary in the Gospel of Luke, some say everywhere in the first two chapters, the, the birth infancy narrative, take Mary's name out, put your own name, put Christian, put church. And the same would be true to us. Mary was impregnated with the person of Jesus Christ. So are we, men and women alike. Men, here's a chance for us to be pregnant with the very reality of Christ, and we are to birth this Christ in the world constantly. And the sad part is this. This happened 2,000 years ago. We've had 2,000 years of reflection on this. Are we any better than they were 1,000 years ago? I'm not sure. I'm reading this book, and at the very end of the book, it's about families. It's Matthew Kelly, and he, he says that his parents had two things on the dining room wall, all growing up, the nine, nine sons grew up in this household. And the one was, you've seen that, that thing that says, if you criticize a child, they will condemn others. If you, it gives you this whole list. In other words, what you do to them, they'll probably pretty much do the same. But the other one was the United Nations Charter of Children. I think there's 10 things in this United Nations Charter that says, all children should be treated with dignity no matter what their race, their color, their creed. All children should be able to have basic education for free. Every child should be educated, up to a certain age at least. Every child should respect, be respected and loved and treated with fairness. Every child should be surrounded by goodness and help form them as, as good people. They need it. They can't do it on their own. They're dependent on us. And the charter is the United Nations Charter, so they're supposed to be the whole world would say, this is what we commit to for our children. Is it? It is for my children. But for our children, are we any better than a thousand years ago? Sometimes I look at the paper and I think, we're in the medieval ages. We just have better, faster, quicker weapons, more powerful. So do we ever need this day of the cross? Do we ever need this Good Friday? As some would say, what's so good about Good Friday? It should be the worst Friday. But it is Good Friday because of what it calls us to. Calls us back to humanity. And we have the one that we say is Jesus, this perfectly amazing human man that walked the earth for 33 years, infused with this cosmic, eternal God in Christ that makes his words eternal and gives them power that can change and transform our very lives, our way of thinking, our way of acting. So today, as we lift up this cross, one response could be just this. God, I'm sorry for all my sins. Thank you for dying for me on the cross, and I feel so guilty. Please do more than that. Please. As we carry this cross over our shoulders and pass it on, realize this is a connection to the Christ. A connection to the Christ. We're touching the cross on which Jesus, this man, filled with the Christ, the eternal Christ, died. And we, we believe, we know the end of the story, that he will be raised up and lives eternally because the Christ can never be destroyed. The Christ filled this man and, and brought him back, brought him into a new and eternal life. We don't say that it is just Jesus that was raised, but Jesus the Christ. And we see the revelation, the fulfillment of that revelation in that resurrection moment. But we lift that cross over our heads and pass it on to one another. We give it, we receive it. Because we're saying as Roman Catholic people of this church, we want to be people of this cross. We want to be people who know the Christ. And we want to say, proclaim it with, with a, a pride, not a, a proud pride, but a humble pride. This Christ is ours and dwells in us, and we want to give him to the world. I want to give this Christ to the world.
And so for that reason, we know everything we can possibly know about every single word he said, but realize it goes way beyond that. Because the eternal God entered into him and gave him to us, raised him up, and he lives and dwells forever in each one of us and in all of us.